Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, for those of you who might not have read the, uh, the, the caption, this is the IE Space and Politics Club. This is our first event. We're a club that just got created a few months ago. Uh, and the reason why we created this club is because today, space is not only a futuristic perspective or something that comes from science fiction or whatever. It's actually something that is not only affecting, but changing a lot of aspects of everyday lives. So today we wanted to welcome you to this, uh, to this first event. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. It's gonna be about the new space race, which is a very, very interesting topic. And uh, I'm gonna introduce Professor Borja Santos, who is the executive director of under undergraduate programs here at the School of uh, Politics, Economics and Global Affairs of IE University uh, to talk about this wonderful field. And um, yes, Professor Borja for your Well, thank you. This is just an introduction. Here are our protagonist, is Ibrahim, our faculty, and, and many more that will come. I, I prepare some words because I think this is a special day. Um, because I'm thrilled that we are introducing the space and geopolitics clubs. Because in all my time at this university, I have seen many new beginnings, but this club speaks to something vast and wonderful, both the promise of space and the complexity of geopolitics. We often look up at the night sky, thinking of distant stars and galaxies, but nowadays space is also about practical challenges and opportunities right here on Earth. So as we dream about colonizing Mars, we have already an elective led by Charlie and Ibrahim about that. We think about mining asteroids or building bases on the moon. We need to think about what those steps mean for us, for our countries and for the world. For instance, in terms of territory, territory the moon. Uh, I heard that there are spots in the moon called peaks of eternal light. And these uh, spots in the moon, they are always in satellite. So they are therefore ideal for solar power. Power. So what if two countries want to set up solar power there? Who gets to decide who is gonna install and set up the energy solar power there? Let's, do, let's think about resources. Imagine a company that successfully mines an asteroid and finds very precious minerals. Let's say finds gold. Who that? So that gold belongs to whom? The company, the home country, where that company belongs to, or belongs to everyone on Earth? Or let's think about the trash, the satellites and space junk. Right now, thousands of satellites orbit our Earth, and they help us to communicate, to navigate, and many things more, right? But what happens when they break or collapse? Who is the job of cleaning up all that mess? So how do we prevent potential space traffic jumps that very soon we might um, observe? So these questions might sound like they are from science fiction book, but they are very real and they become more pressing in the coming years. So I think that's why your club, the Baptist and your colleagues, is so timely. So here you will not just learn about these issues, we'll also debate, discuss, and hopefully, um, well, you will try to find out how the future will look like. So I'm really proud of you to start this club. I think this is a testament of your forward thinking and the kind of vision our university stands for. So the members of this club, this is club, sorry, be curious, be open-minded, and remember that decisions made about space in the next few decades will shape our future for centuries to come. So um, congratulations, and we are looking forward to the future activities this club will develop. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for the encouragement. Um, and now we open the floor to Dr. Ibrahim al Marashi, who, if you've never had the chance of having him as a professor, is a core member of the IE community, uh, is also someone who's uh, been with us with this, uh, with, this, uh, with this plan for this club for a while, and who, are, who is our academic advisor for the club, actually, and someone who knows 
a tremendous amount about uh, well this topic. So thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours. My pleasure. I am going to start out this lecture with a question. Uh, for the students who've had me in the past, don't give away the answer. Okay, don't, don't, don't cheat. This is for the, the new generation. It's a question that reflects your generation as well. This is the question I'm going to ask you. I want you here to give me the NGO the non-governmental organization that transformed politics on the eve of the 21st century. So I want you to think, what NGO is out there that transformed the world as we know it, particularly your generation beginning in the 21st century? Non-governmental organization. Now, by non-governmental organizations, do not mix them up with the United Nations. Any of their organizations are multilateral. So I'm not looking for a United Nations organization. I'm looking for a non-governmental organization. All right? Yes, so since we're talking about space, probably um, the phases would be involved in the mosque. So these are individuals. So they founded a non-governmental organization that transformed the world. And usually non-governmental organizations are usually founded by pioneering individuals. Greenpeace is a good answer. Greenpeace is a non-governmental organization. Uh, I would have loved it if they transformed the world as we know it. Okay. Dirty energy, would they fight against? I would love it if dirty energy was no longer a problem. Whaling, I would love it if there's... No whaling, but I don't think it meets the room. Right? I wish it did. Yes. SpaceX. SpaceX is technically it's non-governmental. Um, almost, almost. Uh, SpaceX is technically a corporation. Okay, so unlike Greenpeace, it definitely has promise, as we're going to look at in the lecture, but still technically is not a non-governmental organization, even though that answer is related to what I'm looking for. Okay, so UNICEF is part of the United Nations. So in that case, it's technically a multilateral organization. JB? Al-Qaeda? Really? A terrorist organization? Al-Qaeda. A terrorist organization. That's the end here. Okay. Take it. Leave it to a Middle Easterner to give me the answer I was looking for. Yes, it's Al-Qaeda as the right answer. Al-Qaeda, ah, exactly. Now I see all of your shocked faces, right? Because usually when you think of an NGO, you think of an organization that does good, right? Okay. Is Al-Qaeda non-governmental? Yes. yes. Okay, no government would dare want to own Al-Qaeda. <laughs> is it an organization? Uh, its official title is Tanzim Al-Qaeda. It, it calls itself the Al-Qaeda organization. The point is, you couldn't imagine Al-Qaeda as an NGO, right? Because the, in the age we're living in, just as we can't imagine Al-Qaeda as an NGO, we are going to have trouble imagining how will international relations adapt to space. The politics of space is very much part of an age where Look at the following. The space race 1.0 was part of the Cold War. It was that part of that bipolar structure of international relations where really only superpowers can get involved in the beginning. And now when we're talking about the space race, I'm gonna give you the first space race very briefly, but it was the US and the USSR, or I should say the USSR and the US. Technically the first state to enter the space race was neither, it was Germany. And I'll tell you how. Germany was the first nation to begin the space race. Okay. It was the age of superpowers. When we enter the 21st century, I want you to think of the transformation. George Orwell had it right when it came down to the Cold War. 
So George Orwell, the author of Animal Farm, I want you to think of 1984. I want you to think of what we would call a foreign fighter who literally got his military experience on the fields not too far away from here during the Spanish Civil War. Come on in anywhere you like. Okay. George Orwell, imagine a world in 1984. And I want you to think of the actual 1984. The world divided into three competing blocks. Oceania, so on and so forth, with alliances always shifting. And in a sense, he got it right. <clears throat> the first world, the second world, the third world, almost corresponded to Orwell's vision in his dystopian future. Who predicted the 21st century was the writer Ian Fleming. Think of the villains of the 007 series. They're usually all super wealthy, super empowered evil geniuses, and they transform the world. Al-Qaeda's Osama bin Laden would seem to come out of an Ian Fleming novel. But the whole point was this, and once you think of the 21st century, think how a single Saudi individual was able to go to the U.S. and say, I'm going to strike the heart of your financial center, as well as your political capital, and get you to declare war on me for 20 years. That was a super empowered individual. Now, I want you to think about this. Think of an individual who doesn't run an NGO, he runs a corporation, okay? But could go to Russia, the successor of the Soviet Union, and say, regardless of your interests, I am going to defy you by giving another sovereign nation the ability to communicate and coordinate its military assets during wartime, and I have no fear for the repercussions. And again, I'm not saying Osama bin Laden is like Elon Musk, even though some of you might think so. Okay, I wouldn't say that. But I want you to say how both of them are just simply super empowered individuals that have the status to stand up to a superpower. What governs actors like this? You see, when we get to the governing of space, then we're getting to new terrain and new actors. It's not only the super wealthy. Now we could get to Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. But new actors. Remember, India and China, you have to under, understand. In 1957, if I would have told you India and China would one day enter a space race, you would be laughed at. India had just been independent for a few years. China is in the state of revolution. And they were collectively called the third world. The idea that the third world would enter the space of the 21st century, that's the new space race. Super wealthy individuals. Space race. And then small entrance, Luxembourg and the United Arab Emirates. Are non-governmental organizations such as Al-Qaeda hmm. even going away in the 21st century? Would there be such a thing as space terrorism? Think of what evolved from Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS. In the future, will there be an Islamic State of Iraq in space? Still ISIS. These are all things we don't know about. So what are we going to look at this lecture? Is a couple of things. One is astro-nationalism. This is a common dynamic. At the end of the day, Everything governing space in terms of treaties, international laws were designed by nations in a united body called the United Nations. The laws of space were dictated by nations, but what have I just said? The entrants aren't necessarily nations. They're SpaceX. They could be non-state actors. Okay. Still, nothing has gone away in the sense that progress in space is a matter of pride for both the U.S. and the USSR. What drove the space race wasn't necessarily entirely geopolitical interests, but they were the intangible interests of pride of reaching the moon for the first time or pride of sending the woman, the first woman into space. And that hasn't changed. Think of the amount of pride India had reaching the moon when Russia failed. All of that is elements of astro-nationalism and it won't go away. Nationalism is just projected into space. So we're talking about the space age. 
Let's look at this sentence. Nothing is true. Everything is permissible. Was a quote by a, a, the famous old man of the mountain, a group of assassins in northern Iran. Hassan is Sabah, the only spiritual leader with anything to say in the space age. William S. Bureau is one of the writers of the peak generation, also a heroin addict, but nonetheless. Okay, what is the space age? Well, I'm going to take you there. When did it begin? And did it ever end? Now, I want to show you an article like this. Geopolitics will be transformed into something now that more accurately can be described as geospatial politics. Remember, the geo and geopolitics refers to the Earth as a space to be contested over. The geospatial now means, okay, where does this end and this begin? The way we define it is almost arbitrary. Space technically begins about 100 kilometers up there, uh, 60 miles. But the way we imagine space is in the process that we call the securitization of space. And this is also I'm going to uh, show you in this lecture. Okay, what do I mean by the securitization of space? The best way to teach you securitization theory is to give you a great world global event, the transforming global event that you have witnessed that was securitized. The COVID pandemic. What is COVID? A simple chain of RNA that wants to replicate. COVID literally is a meme that wants to go viral. Look at the language we use to describe COVID. That's what we mean by securitization. Did nations declare war on COVID? Absolutely. Israel called the COVID an invisible enemy. Trump declared war on COVID. In Iran, the healthcare workers who died fighting COVID, look at the language, fighting COVID, would be guaranteed martyrdom status. In Italy, the paramilitary unit, the Carabinieri, developed vaccines and called it weapons against an invisible enemy. Now, I want you to think about this. Is there a land called Covidstan with its capital, Covidia, with its general, COVID more? who could basically say, you've won, you invaded me, I surrender. That's what we mean by securitization. When we take things and make them security-related issues, they aren't naturally out there. The languages we use in speech acts securitizes the subject. Here we're witnessing in our lifetime the securitization of space. When you talk about war in space, uh, here you're beginning to securitize basically the stars above us. Securitization of space. When we use language such as spaceships, we are beginning to use the language of the military to describe how power will be projected above. That is all examples of the securitization of space. So this is one element we're really looking at. So let's begin. <laughs> let's begin in 2100 BCE. Space was something to be revered, awe, oh, in awe, something to be worshipped, as we see the crescent moon here, standing in for the moon goddess scene. We go from that to this. The moon isn't something to be worshipped. It's something to be carved up. The date of this article, September 30th, 2023. The race to carve up space gives you now kind of a transformation in the way we imagine space. This is Artemis, the divine feminine. Again, something to be worshipped, Artemis or Diana, who were a stand-in for the moon. This is the Artemis of the 21st century. And I just love how this picture has the moon in the background. So let's begin with this. And you might ask, what does this have to do with the space race? Who would win? Who would win? Some white guy dealing drugs, a powerful Chinese dynasty with a rich history and the mandate of heaven. This meme is a reference to the opium war. The white guy dealing drugs is referring to the British trade in opium. I want you to think during the opium wars, how an entity like the East India Company 
could stand up to a powerful Chinese dynasty with a rich history and the mandate of heaven. I want you to think of the East India Company and its global reach, its ability to stand up to empires and basically bend empire to its will. Basically say to an empire, we will ignore your sovereignty. And I want you to ask, since the East India Company, can anyone give me a company comparable to the East India Company in terms of scope and strength? Well, that's how space the assets of Elon Musk have been described. And again, it goes back to that earlier exercise when I was saying how super empowered individuals could stand up to one of the most powerful states and basically say, we will aid your adversary without worrying about the repercussions. And then aiding that adversary, basically, the head of a company almost becomes a power on the world stage on par with Vladimir Putin. I want you to think of somebody who had in a company that tried that and failed miserably. Prigozhin of the private military company Wagner. And making a march onto Moscow this summer, he was trying to elevate himself, almost make him an equal to Putin. And Putin refused to deal with him directly. It was through Belarus that the uh, channels were made during his march onto Moscow. But this is the thing I wonder. Does Elon Musk have a direct line to Putin? And if so, again, think about how the ability to have the power to manage communications via space back onto the earth on a battlefield gives him some kind of asymmetrical power. And this is what we're looking at. When we look at the Space Age 2.0, the Soviet Union, the US were more or less symmetrical powers. This is what we're looking at. The new space race will be that of asymmetry. Okay, our own president, Santiago, Nieguez wrote an article recently on LinkedIn looking at the various entrants into the space race, okay? the so-called space titans. Okay? And the fact that this article is written looking at Virgin Galactic and Elon Musk's SpaceX is an indication they're all products of our time. They're all indicative of this new space race. Okay. So let's begin. It's quite interesting how two people with a four letter first name and a four letter last name could basically have such an impact. And sure enough, one, Elon Musk not only likes to uh, call out Mark Zuckerberg, he also likes to call out Karl Marx. Okay, now in both cases, what were they advocating? Well, one is industrialism versus capitalism controlled by the state, okay? or the, the so-called left versus right. Now, this is just projecting into the future, but I can't think of any other individual. If something called Muslimism were to ever develop, what would that be? Well, we all know that Musk is all about industrialism and digitalism not being controlled by the state. Okay? But the possibility of a new realm of politics a politics versus Earth versus Mars, the possibility of that future. <laughs> Musk in his lifetime never ever got to see his ideology applied to the Russian Empire, the future Soviet Union, probably in his wildest imagination. He probably couldn't have imagined that happen. Okay. The idea of interplanetary relations might not have it been in Musk's time. But again, the person who imagined it, we can say. The idea of making humanity an interplanetary species. Okay. A lot of people had the ideas of communism before Karl Marx. He does get most of the credit. And I think in the future, it will be Musk who gets the credit okay, of envisioning humanity as a species, as a multi-planetary species. Okay. And this, uh, let's have Elon make fun of Marx one more time before we keep on going. Okay. So let's begin our story really quickly. The very first rockets began as solid fuel rockets that looked like this. Okay. 
<laughs> they're more or less essentially firecrackers. And I want you to think of a firecracker, and it's very good to understand that's what a solid fuel rocket is. The minute you launch a firecracker, do you have control over its trajectory? When you, you ignite a, a firecracker, the fuel burns, and that's it. Okay, Very little control over the process. For the most part, they were developed in China. Rockets were used to fight off the Mongols. They didn't work very much. Rockets were used by Arabs in Valencia. They didn't make very effective weapons. And finally, the fact that India was able to send a rocket to the moon is iconic because look at this soldier from one of the Indian states. Again, think of the East India Company and his power going into India. And what are we seeing are the Indian resistance forces using rockets against the British. And look at those red coats fly. Again, great. Psychological weapons didn't have much on the battlefield. Forces that used the rockets still surrendered here to a General Cornwallis. He lost America, but won India. But nevertheless, what are the British good at? And I can say this because I'm British going into Asian countries and taking things as their own. What did they take? Rockets. This is the battle during the War of 1812 for Maryland. And what is being used here? Rockets launched from ships. Okay. There you go. And I want you to think of the American National Anthem that was written in response to the War of 1812. What was bursting in there? <laughs> there were bombs bursting in air, and then the reference to the rocket's red glare. Now you know where it came from, from the battlefield in India, okay, to the shores of Maryland, making it all the way into the American National Anthem. And then from this point onwards, rockets more or less fell into abeyance. It was artillery on ships, cannons that dominated the rest of military history. And this is a joke, but uh, if you look at this meme, British after realizing Mars hasn't been colonized yet, okay? Um, for most part, these ships would use cannons, but the language we use to imagine Mars and describe Mars, I show this meme because look at what this model rocket kit is called, Destination Mars Colonizer. Okay, and there is an entire literature saying it's quite frightful that we use the language of colonies and westward expansion, the language of empire to describe space. It doesn't inevitably have to be this way, yet yeah, this is the language we are using. So then, a new age in the space race, when we could talk about the first man, human-made object to enter lower space, Credit usually goes to the Vengeance 2 rocket. The Vengeance 2 rocket fired off the shores of Europe to land on the United Kingdom, a ballistic missile that is going into the atmosphere, high into the atmosphere, and gravity bringing it down, the first human-made object to enter space. And for more or less, if you see the flags here of not only Germany, but the US, the Soviet Union, and the UK, the designers of this technology uh, were quick to grab the scientists who developed this. And more or less, it's the same technology that will create humanity, take humanity to the moon. If you wanna say, when did the space race began? In theory, it could have began in the uh, soil of Germany, when both the US and the Soviet Union was hunting down the German rocket scientists. Some German rocket scientists, such as Werner von Braun, willingly gave himself up to the US and would be not only the architect of the V2 program, but America's space program. When the V2 first hit its target during World War II, Von Braun apparently said, that's great, but it hit the wrong planet. Because Von Braun always had the vision that it was this technology that was supposed to take humanity to outer space, not to be weaponized. And if you could just see in terms of sheer scale, I mean, and here are the new entrants. Blue Origin is associated with Jeff Bezos's uh, corporation. So now I want you to think just as the V2 went into space, another game changing weapon <laughs> was unleashed. 
over the skies of Japan, the atomic bomb. And I want you to remember how the <laughs> atomic bomb delivered. It was delivered by a long range aircraft, in this case, an American B-29 bomber. Now, you see, I showed you this just to show how did they celebrate dropping the atomic bomb in the US. And look at the word I use, celebrate. You can buy actually toys where I don't know how a toy can be safe, harmless, giant atomic bomb. It's apparently those firecrackers that you launch on the floor. That's what you're buying. But the point I show you, this was atomic weapons were delivered by aircraft over mass distances. It's the same in this comic book. Up until this point, it's a comic book called Atomic War. Who is delivering the atomic weapons? Again, aircraft. Red, when I fire my atomic bomb. Okay, <laughs> think of the atomic bomb. Think of the atomic bomb. Big, unwieldy, heavy, delivered usually by long range bombers. So when you look at this, now you'll understand the shock that was caused when an object this size went into space. And to kind of give you that horror from the American side, let's look at CBS News 1957. <laughs> For those of you who are studying communication, it's amazing how far television news has come, but let's watch the follow CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik 1, the Soviet space satellite. Douglas Edwards reporting. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik. Remember, the language frontier says a lot because of the American mindset. What is the frontier? That was the West to be conquered. What in the U.S. mindset was the frontier. Remember, it's just home for the Native American, right? So I want you to be wary of the language that's used to describe space historically. The first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. One of the places where the progress of the satellite is being watched most closely is the Hayden... Look at the language, a man-made satellite, because nothing exists in the English language to describe it. Satellites technically refer to the moon. The moon is a satellite, right? Now what do we have for the first time in humanity? You have to invent a word, a man-made satellite. Okay? And then see in just other languages, in Arabic, what is a satellite, right? It's the artificial moon. Planetarium in New York. CBS News correspondent Richard C. Hotlet reports from there now. Doug, we're in the Great Dome of the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and I have with me Dr. Kenneth Franklin, an astronomer on the planetarium staff. You probably know a very famous scientist associated with this place today, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, this is where he were, uh, is affiliated with today. Dr. Franklin, can you tell us where the Sputnik is now and how it's moving? Right now, it's north of Auckland, New Zealand, and moving southeast. It will be, in 10 minutes, about 1,500 miles north of Little America. And in about 24 minutes, it will be uh, over Santiago, Chile. And in about 50 minutes from now, it will be over Spain. Well, it looks as though it'll be missing the United States on this trip. That's quite correct, it will. But it does come over here periodically, doesn't it? It comes over here at least twice a day and maybe more. Uh, getting back to this track, is it possible that it is transmitting a code, not just a beep signal for uh, radio uh, listening? Yes, it's quite possible that it's transmitting a code, uh, but we don't uh, realize what the code is, of course. The initial thrust... What is being said there? Is it transmitting a code? Because what do you have for the first time in history? A code that can violate the sovereignty of a nation state, you see. The U.S. has now no control over this human-made object that flies over the United States. In other words, what's being said there? What is the shock? The sovereignty of the U.S. is, no, is being violated. No longer do the, do the two oceans separating the U.S. from other theaters of conflict protect its security. To get it into the air comes from the lowest and biggest of the rockets in the tandem. When the American satellite is launched, the takeoff power will come from a rocket like this one shown in a recent test. The powerful thrust of the Arrow B sends the whole assembly up through the dense stratosphere, a layer of heavy air 50 miles thick surrounding the Earth. 
The first rocket is then dropped. So that's the technology that has to be developed. The problem in the U.S. is not ready to launch. Now, here is a good example of. I want you to see satellites like Sputnik were delivered by rockets like this. America's first attempt to deliver an equivalent is known as Vanguard, right there. And let's see what happens with that launch. And if you want to know a definition of hubris, it's this. Launching a rocket for the first time without testing it and having news cameras there, and you'll see why. A six-inch moon that was to have been America's first Earth satellite. Oh, sorry. So the six-inch moon, because the language is still being developed, right? Moon and satellite being used interchangeably. A six-inch moon that was to have been America's first Earth satellite and a Vanguard rocket that was to have sent it on its globe-circling career from Cape Canaveral in Florida. A moment or two of high expectation after the firing button has been pressed. Is that a fuel leak there in the first section of the three-stage rocket? Disaster follows, as this official film shows only too clearly. Fire followed the explosion. The launching of an American moon had still to be accomplished. A big setback indeed, but probably more so in the realm of prestige and propaganda than in any other way. Moon that... Two lessons from here. First, the British media is really harsh, okay, for our constitution. Second, a bigger blow for British propaganda. I'm sorry, American propaganda and prestige. That's what I'm talking about when I say astro-nationalism. The Vanguard failed. This was a project developed by the U.S. Navy. Now, remember, the United States doesn't have an Air Force just yet. And later, the rocket fleets and then their parallel projects, ballistic missiles, would be developed and managed by air forces. Now, what was the great fear of Sputnik? It was the following. The great fear of Sputnik was this. If it could deliver a satellite in space, like an atomic bomb, could it potentially have that atomic bomb not go into orbit, but go into such a trajectory where it will land back in Earth? That's the birth of the nuclear missile scare. You see, every rocket test, becomes a basically a means to test what will later be a nuclear missile. See, it's the politics of the Cold War being projected into space. You basically, you could say, we're doing this for science. But at the end of the day, the same technology that will put a satellite in space can also put a nuclear weapon in space. And then just what happens, you let gravity do the work and bring the nuclear warfare back to Earth. Nothing has changed to this very day. Now, the Vanguard was developed by the US Navy. The US Army was also developing a parallel project called Redstone. And Redstone was designed by the German scientist, Werner von Braun. Vanguard failed, Redstone put the first American into space. And the space race was on. Now, I want you to think of this. Look again at the imagery here, because what's fascinating, if you look at the Soviet vision of conquering the moon, it looks very much of the imagery that SpaceX uses and its starship on the moon. But I thought I'll just give you, a, there's a good number of Russian speakers here. I thought I'll give you the, the Russian version of their space race. Let's just watch the following. How did Russia get into space? How did they get the first man into space? This is a kind of Russian-Soviet take on those events. The short history of the USSR. 
А, я вам расскажу, ну, ну там про Советский Союз. И, и, и хотите? Э, началось все, короче, так. Э, ну, шел как-то Ленин и, и видит, что ну, все плохо живут люди. Э, подошел Ленин ко всем людям и говорит: э, Че это вы при царе плохо живете? Давайте вы при мне плохо жить будете. И такой прыг-скок на броневик. И говорит, будем, говорит, союз советских социалистических республик строить. И все закачали ура, хотя кроме слова строить ничего не поняли. А злой матрос сказал, и всех убьем. А добрый матрос сказал, нет, не всех. А еще был матрос, которому все равно было, и он ничего не сказал. Вот. И все начали Ленина целовать тогда, а он спать лег. И пришел, значит, Сталин и говорит, меня теперь целуйте. А его все боялись целовать, потому что у него усы были, и он щекотался. И он злой стал и пошел спать сразу, через 31 год. Пришел Хрущев и говорит, всех в космические галактики пошлю. И все расстроились, потому что кроме слова «пошлю» не поняли ничего. У Хрущева было три варианта, кого в космос послать. Хрущев говорит, ты полетишь. Пират говорит, я. Хрущев говорит, да нет, ты. Фермер такой, я. А Хрущев такой, да не ты, а вот этот, который рядом с тобой. И пират такой, значит, я все-таки. Ура, говорит. Хрущев говорит, так, вы двое отошли. Да не вы. Ты вот в странном костюме. Как твоя фамилия? Морган. Да не ты, твоя со шлемом. Как фамилия? Клизмин. не с такой фамилией в космос лететь нельзя. А мамы твои как фамилия? Пупочкина. А, а бабушки как фамилия? Бюлент Карткмаз. Дед. Маккинси Стюарт Уэлш. Так, ты слабатый, как твоя фамилия? Гагарин. О, ты полетишь, иди переодевайся. Сказал, так Хрущев и спать лег. А потом пошел Меня, говорит, не надо целовать. И сам всех целовать начал. И его никто не боялся целовать. Потому что у него хоть и были усы, но они у него над глазами росли. Они у него высоко вверх росли, и он, чтобы не улететь от ветра, и к себе на грудь всякие железки повесил и спать лег. Пришли Андропов и Черненко. Ну, я же не знаю, как они выглядели, и может и так. Короче, пришли они и спать легли сразу. И потом Горбачев пришел, говорит, ну углубить, начать там консенсус. И все закричали, ура, хотя вообще ничего не поняли. У Горбачева на голове была каляка-маляка. Он ее никому не показывал, и поэтому шляпу не снимал никогда-никогда. А потом... Горбачев начал ездить везде, ну, в Америку там и везде еще, и его там все целовали, и, и на нас у него не было времени, и Советский Союз развалился, потому что человеку обязательно нужен кто-то рядом, чтобы его целовать. Пойду, мам, поцелую. When U.S. President Nixon, in an attempt to reconcile with the U.S., a joint space 
program was launched, okay, where two American spacecraft would meet in space and the astronauts would greet each other. The newspapers. Yeah, let's watch. This is a cute video, let's watch. On October 4th, 1957, the world watched in awe and fear as the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, <laughs> the world's first man-made satellite, into space. This little metal ball, smaller than two feet in diameter, launched a space race between the U.S. and USSR that would last for 18 years and change the world as we know it. Sputnik was actually not the first piece of human technology to enter space. That superlative goes to the V-2 rocket, used by Germany in missile attacks against Allied cities as a last-ditch effort in the final years of World War II. It wasn't very effective, but at the end of the war, both the U.S. and USSR had captured the technology and the scientists that had developed it and began using them for their own projects. And by August 1957, the Soviets successfully tested the first intercontinental ballistic missile. That says a lot. Okay, the R-7 could travel across continents. Ballistic <laughs> means it goes into space before it lands back on Earth. The R-7, the same rocket that would be used to launch Sputnik two months later. No, so the scary thing about Sputnik was not the orbiting ball itself, but the fact that the same technology could be used to launch a <laughs> nuclear warhead at any city. <laughs> Not wanting to fall too far behind, President Eisenhower ordered the Navy to speed up its own project and launch a satellite as soon as possible. So, on December 6, 1957, excited people across the nation tuned in to watch the live broadcast as the Vanguard TV-3 satellite took off and crashed to the ground two seconds later. The Vanguard failure was a huge embarrassment for the United States. Newspapers printed headlines like Flopnik and Kaputnik, and a Soviet delegate at the UN. And stay put, Nick. Now look at what the Soviet delegate at the UN does to sass the US. Mockingly suggested that the US should receive foreign aid for developing nations. <laughs> Fortunately, the army had been working on their own parallel project, the Explorer, which was successfully launched in January 1958. But the US had barely managed to catch up before they were surpassed again as Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space in April 1961. Almost a year passed, and several more Soviet astronauts completed their missions before Project Mercury succeeded in making John Glenn the first American in orbit in February 1962. By this time, President Kennedy had realized that simply catching up to each Soviet advance of a few months later, wasn't going to cut it. The U.S. had to do something first. And in May 1961, a month after Gagarin's flight, he announced the goal of putting a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. They succeeded in this through the Apollo program, with Neil Armstrong taking his famous step on July 20th, 1969. With both countries next turning their attention to orbital space stations, there's no telling how much longer the space race could have gone on. But because of improving relations negotiated by Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev and U.S. President Nixon, the USSR and U.S. moved toward cooperation rather than competition. The successful joint mission known as Apollo-Soyuz, in which an American Apollo spacecraft docked with a Soviet Soyuz craft and the two crews met, shook hands, and exchanged gifts, marked the end of the space race in 1975. So, in the end, what was the point of this whole space race? Was it just a massive waste of time? Two major superpowers trying to outdo each other by pursuing symbolic projects that were both dangerous and expensive, using resources that could have been better spent elsewhere? Well, sure, sort of. But the biggest benefits of the space program had nothing to do with one country beating another. During the space race, funding for research and education in general increased dramatically, leading to many advances that may not have otherwise been made. 
Many NASA technologies developed for space are now widely used in civilian life, from memory foam in mattresses, to freeze-dried food, to LEDs in cancer treatment. And of course, the satellites that we rely on for our GPS and mobile phone signals would not have been there without the space program. All of which goes to show that the rewards of scientific research and advancement are often far more vast than even the people pursuing them can imagine. So, the second space race. Look at the reference to the first space race and the second space race. My dad got to watch Armstrong walk on the moon. I get to watch the guy who killed bookstores ride a dick into space. And that's it in a single tweet. The fascinating thing about galactic, virgin galactic, again, who would have guessed a person who by, 20, by age 20 made millions off records would make the United Kingdom a player in the space race as well. But the idea of aircraft taking off from the United Kingdom, launching rockets from the aircraft usually uh, used to fly across the Atlantic, had the potential of making Virgin a space, uh, Virgin and the United Kingdom a space power as well. Then we get to SpaceX. And again, just to think about the super empowered individual. This YouTube clip at the time I took it had 10.2 million views. Let's see where we are now. At 11 million views, I want you to look at the following video, and then read a very interesting comment on the bottom. So this is video cartoon animation of an actual launch that occurred. The god awful small affair <coughs> To the girl with the mousy hair But her mommy is yelling no And her daddy has told her to go but her friend is nowhere to be seen Now she walks through her sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view And she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a sad thing for For she's lived it ten times That's or more car in the payload. She could spit in the eyes of fools And say ask her to fall Yeah. 
Yes, there is a Tesla Roadster in space. Look at this comment on YouTube. There is now a non-zero percent chance of getting hit by a car in space. What a time to be alive. This is the second stage of the space age. And now if we look at some of the competitors here. The Artemis rocket that I showed you is right here, otherwise known as the Space Launch System. This was the Saturn V, which took humanity to the moon. Okay. But if you compare them, this, and even get it here, this is the Starship, what will take humanity potentially to Mars. There we go. Uh, there you get kind of the size and scope of the audacity of this project. No. <laughs> what else is potentially in space? First ever space hotels slated to be operational by 2027. What is this guy saying? Literally, we just want health care. Now, this is also a reference to a film known as Elysium. <laughs> where the very wealthy live in space, have access to great health care, and everyone else is left on Earth. And perhaps this is the future. We don't know, but what would be electron space without little cat? Small cat, get out of that spaceship. Stop that right now. Stop exploring the cosmos, small cat. You are misbehaving. <laughs> As we go into the future, there is now a new field. The newest field of international relations is known as astropolitics. Okay. This is a fascinating field because all of a sudden international relations. Do you see how the term internations might be uh, again made redundant once we bring in planets into the study of politics? Astropolitics, as you see, can, has taken off as a term. Uh, this is an article that yours truly wrote, that even Iran, when it fails to launch a satellite in space, still is a victory, because basically, what does it show the U.S.? Okay, we can't get a satellite in space, but what does the U.S. see in that failed satellite launch? Okay, that's bad for them, but it's also bad for us, because that means their missiles are going farther and farther still. If there's one article, though, I would highly recommend that you read from mine, it's the following. Uh, female astronaut Sally Ride and Ellen Ochoa paved the way for women to soar into space. Okay. Uh, the person here, Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, was my professor of astrophysics. If life had gone in a different direction, yes, I should be designing rockets, not teaching you guys on Earth. <laughs> Elena Cho was the first woman of Hispanic heritage to enter space, okay? And why is this article important to read? Because in this article, I talk about something else that could defy gravity, and that's patriarchy. That's both women not only have to defy gravity, but to defy the patriarchy that basically told them that women could not go into space. Sally Wright had a mission to go into space for less than a month. Do you know the famous story of what the male scientists at NASA wanted to give her? Does anyone know? Um, uh, Jay Latte? <laughs> uh, like, like an insane amount of tampons. An insane amount of tampons. This is what we talk about having to deal with patriarchy going into space. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's any book you want to read about space flight, this is one I recommend. It just came out very recently. Not the technology engineering, you can read that. That's by Ellen Ochoa, but this book about her life. Uh, for those of you studying economics, there is such a thing, the political economy of the space age. Next to a book I took a picture of that also describes your generation. 
There are a master's program in space entrepreneurship, and hopefully this campus will open its equivalent. Okay, But we have a campus in Segovia. We have a campus in Madrid. What would an IE University campus look like in Mars? Well, let's go to our president to see what that would look like. <laughs> So this is our president, if you don't know. Let's listen to the following. How will higher education look like on the surface of Mars 50 years from now? Well, first, the future students will be much better equipped than the current ones. They will have access to a very vast knowledge and to many different new disciplines. Second, knowledge will have progressed to that uh, stage when they will be able to strengthen their skills and all their capabilities. But probably the major difference as compared to current higher education offerings is that education will be much more customized. It will be personalized. In the past, education was a standardization process. Most students had to pass certain level. In the future, education will become much focused on the individual and will strengthen all the potentialities of each of the students. But what is the major challenge 50 years from now for higher education institutions, for universities and for educators as well? I guess it may have to do with how to create the augmented brain. We have brains that were designed in the reptile age and uh, as compared to many new devices of artificial intelligence, our brains lag behind in many different respects. The first one, of course, has to do with education throughout our lives, from the very early stages to the ages, old ages, when we become seniors, and we need to continue attending education. In fact, lifelong learning has to be a reference for all the professionals in the future. Of course, nanotechnology will bring many different possibilities. Also, psychopharmacy, which will provide many solutions in order to enhance all the potentialities of the brain. In sum, the future of higher education is fascinating, and what I hope is that IE University is one of the first institutions to be operational on the surface of Mars. <laughs> Yes. 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 yes, so that's it. Your kids will be able to study on Mars, and probably we will be stuck in the elevator as well. <laughs> 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 that's life at IE should be cool. <laughs> now, of course. Let's look, first of all, at the real space race. The way we imagine space, if you want to ask what was the real space age race, we all take part of it in our daily lives. You understand that? Let's watch the following. I think our solar system looks like this. Really, this is what we're really experiencing. This is what we're living through right at the moment. We are on a space race. We're literally racing through space. This is an appropriate model, but it's much better than the one we usually imagine. this from a metaphysical perspective. The minute we enter space, we're doing something quite profound. Let's look at the following, because there's always been a curiosity. Every single rocket scientist has asked the same question as this little girl. Let's watch what it is. Oracle, are we alone in the universe? Yes. So there's no other life out there. There is. 
they're alone too. And that's it. Sometimes we have to answer this question. Is our space race? Okay. A desire to answer that question, to overcome our planetary loneliness. Finally, the last word goes to Carl Sagan, one of the most phenomenal astrophysicists in history. I want you to look at how in his book on the cosmos, which is a very, I would argue, the best book to read about outer space. Look how he describes a city called Alexandria. People of all nations came there to live, to trade, to learn. On any given day, its harbors were thronged with merchants, scholars, and tourists. This is a city where Greeks, Egyptians, Arabs, Syrians, Hebrews, Persians, Nubians, Phoenicians, Italians, Gauls, and Iberians exchange merchandise and ideas. It's probably here that the word cosmopolitan realized its true meaning citizen, not just of a nation, but of the cosmos, to be a citizen of the cosmos. The word cosmopolitan came up in a discussion with Santiago in which year? 2008. When IE University had how many students? Zero. The first year of IE University, nobody signed up. We weren't sure the project would take off. We were very scared. Yet, despite that fear, Santiago still had a vision that in the future, this institution would be the place for the cosmopolitan to come and study. And I want you to wonder, look at the description now and think of this campus and this space that's built. And the fascinating thing is, do we have Venetians, JB? Yes. <laughs> do we have Iberians here? Gauls, Persians. There should be one at least. Okay. Yes, there's our Persian, okay. Nubians, Italians, Egyptians, Arabs, Syrians, Hebrews, they're all here, okay. And that we see. So if in other words, you think of our president, might be thinking too far in the future of imagining Mars. This was his vision. And here we are in 2023 celebrating. Now, I invite all of you, there is something, a dungeon and dragons in space that the people here, See me and Charlie here developed. Okay. It's a class called Interplanetary Relations. Basically, this lecture, I would argue, this entire course is the brainchild of Charlie, Charles Kushner. And now, I want you to keep your eyes for not only future activities okay, at the Space and Politics Club, but everything I talked about is just a precursor, a mini version of an elective called Interplanetary Relations. For some of you, you're gonna to have to wait maybe four or five years to take it, okay? For some of you, you can look out for the class next semester, okay? The ability to study everything we talked about, over 30 sessions. Oh, very good. I wanna thank you for taking part on this. <laughs> This is also the product of two people. Uh, I want to thank you for all that. So now we have time for questions and answers before we uh, break for beverages. Questions. It was a like with the regarding like. So that's a very good question. How what how will space be governed? Will it be like Antarctica? The various laws that govern Antarctica. So we have an outer space treaty. This is the question. What will govern space? Will it be maritime law applied into space? The Antarctica model has been uh, touted on multiple occasions. But the whole point of that article that I referred to earlier, and this is a fascinating read, so I gave you some material to read. 
I highly recommend this that deals with the international law aspects. Okay. Uh, the whole thing is we don't know. Could Antarctica be the way we govern space? Ideally. In reality, think of the race to get to the moon. And the theory of the moon should be treated like Antarctica. In reality, what will happen? We don't know. That's the interesting age we're living in. The technology is advancing faster than the laws governing it, very much like artificial intelligence. And the whole point is it's technologies are not inseparable. It's AI that will get us to Mars as well. Very good, very good question. Yes, question here? Yes. Okay. So imagine in a scenario where actually we managed uh, to get people living on other planets. Uh, do you think that actually there will be connectivity between planets or actually these societies will develop in their own ways, in their own culture, and actually separate? Well, okay, that's a big question. Number one, think about when societies develop in North and South America, the divergence that happened. So that's often the example that's compared to. How long will it take for a Martian identity to develop, a Martian nationalism? <laughs> Biologically, somebody born in Mars, will not have the same physiology, will not have the same bone structure as somebody on Earth. What will they look like? These are all questions that we're guessing at. These are all scenarios that we're imagining. If you want a good TV series that looks at it, it's called The Expanse, where The Expanse basically plays out a variety of the scenarios. And the class that we're offering next uh, spring on interplanetary relations, a good chunk is dedicated to science fiction, to how we imagine these scenarios playing out. So again, I can't answer your question. I can't answer your questions. And that's what makes the subject fascinating. And particularly in the exercises we use in this class, okay, we can test you about the past on the space race, but going into the future, the professors know just as much as you do. This is a class where you're going to be actually encouraged to use the various artificial intelligence apps to generate plans to settle Mars. Let the AI work for you. We, we're going to encourage it in this class. Because again, our intelligences have trouble imagining this far into the future over that far distance. Very good. Questions? Other questions? Yeah. Yes. So um, I wanted to ask you maybe something you can actually answer because it's more in the present. Um, what are going to be the main motivations going forward and even in the present right now of the players in the space race? Mm -hmm. And if you think any new players may come in, Okay, that's really good. So that's easy. Uh, motivation. Astronationalism hasn't gone anywhere. It's prestige. <laughs> Think of the Pride India film to be able to have an object land on the moon. Prestige, power politics and competition hasn't gone away. Number two, there's obviously a financial incentive. The potential of mining asteroids, the potential of water going into the future, being out in outer space. And then finally, number three, that never goes away, curiosity. Curiosity, what drives science, okay. Those are the three main ones. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask if the military is also gonna be one of those. Okay, you're talking about then the next subject, the militarism. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of such a rude thing to do. But like, <laughs> we first have to conquer cyberspace before we conquer actual space. so, the militarization is made, I put that back into the power right? 
Right. There's often the idea the first power to introduce weapons into space will have an advantage over the other. So far, the UN treaties are preventing the weaponization of space, right? So ideally, the militarization of space won't happen, but it is happening. Uh, hypersonic weapons uh, are going to have ramifications for space. Kinetic objects, objects that just move by a gravity. China has already tested these weapons. So that's going to happen. I, I consider that part of the first category. Very good. Yes. I wanted to ask your views on, I mean, as a law student, I wanted to ask your views on basically more space legislation that's coming up because I think recently with the AI Act, mm -hmm. it's one of the few legislations that actually hold private actors responsible mm -hmm. for um, exploring into space. So do you think that there is actually scope for companies like SpaceX and maybe other companies that have a motive to explore space to be bound by legislation? That's that's what this article makes a very good argument of. Like this so that just came out. And it comes back to the very first exercise we did, right? The whole reason I want you to, to think of NGOs, Greenpeace, SpaceX, was to think of these actors in international relations. How does international law govern Elon Musk right now? How does international law govern ISIS? If they can't be governed by international law on Earth, how will they be governed in space? That's the next legal challenge. Very good question. Yes. Uh, do you think that the Musk enterprise in general, such as SpaceX, uh, will continue to work as a... Um, a public company not affiliated to any government, or will they have to fall under governmental control as the space race continues? That's what this very long New York New Yorker article is about. Will it function and under governmental control or be bound? But I want you to think of what happened with the Starlink constellations and the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine. On one level, it was defying one actor, Russia, okay? But then on another level, at the same time, the information was denied to elements of the Ukrainian military also during a recent campaign. So in this case then, is Musk bound by other any government? Or is acting like any other nation that acts in a realist manner? Remember, the realist school of international relations says one nation might side with one one day, and then side with another the next day, and then change again. And there's nothing preventing a nation from doing this, from playing both <laughs> sides. So if that's the case, and that's what we witnessed with uh, the, you know, providing information, uh, communication, so on and so forth with the Starling constellation, then it's hard to imagine an actor like this being bound, not only by an alliance, this is the thing, but also by government control, being bound by laws. Again, this is all the brave new world we're entering, so to speak, as space <laughs> becomes a securitized arena. Right. Yes? Inspired by the meme about the space hotel and the guy saying, we just want healthcare, mm -hmm. is there maybe a moral dilemma to putting so much effort and resources and time into something that some might argue isn't as necessary compared to maybe environment? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Well, let's, uh, every space launch, if we talk about the moral of the dilemma, every space launch is hugely damaging in terms of the environmental repercussions, in terms of carbon footprints. Okay. Absolutely. There is a moral question. So some might be asking, wouldn't this be better put to saving the planet? The answer is, there's also in space exploration, not necessarily the, the plan B, create another planet to fall back on. Are there ramifications of space exploration in terms of fighting climate change? Satellites do help track the damage, the ongoing fluctuations that are occurring as a result of climate change. So it's yes and no. There's both an answer. Yes, it's hugely expensive space tourism. Taking the, you know, uh, it's just like the, the Titanic subs that collapsed underwater, right? It's similar, it's just going in a different direction. It is the playground of the uber wealthy. Would this money be used for better uh, applications? It's what aspects of the space race it is. So maybe this, yes, 
but at the same time, maybe advances in space exploration, just like in the TEDx video, the TED video said, right? Might have scientific benefits. Uh, the space race also gave us GPS, which is hugely beneficial. Uh, so yes and no, but you're absolutely right. There is a moral country. And then there is just another very good article I was reading. It's the whole reason I have this slide. Will we treat space like an imperial project? Okay. <laughs> Regardless of the damage done to the environment, again, will it open up the same issues that were opened up with imperialism and colonialism? That's also another moral issue that's being debated. Very good. Any other questions, comments, speakers? Yes, so can you yeah. add on that aspect of colonialization? Because, uh, of course, we are seeing that the language being employed here mm -hmm. is very reminiscent of that of the Western frontier, um, of national sentiments. We will call them space colonies. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, do you think it will follow that as model in this or not? No, because not all the players are colonizers. Who did India colonize? <laughs> uh, China was more or less conquered. And so it's not, this is very much an Anglo-American language that's being used. And I think that's what some of the philosophers were calling out. Look at, you know, language that we use like this. So I think it depends on the culture. And this is what's fascinating about the space race is those who were kind of conquered in the past now are able to kind of exert their agency in the economy. All right, very good. I want to thank all of you um, for coming. Uh, I give you oh, okay, yeah, one last question. Okay, sure. yes. Um, so it is a question I should ask in history class, but um, it's about how massive can modernity get before we get to a point where we just need something else to differentiate it. Because one thing is obviously to trans to travel through half the world, go from Europe to the Americas, but another thing completely is to go to another planet yeah. or even to another solar system. At what point is the massiveness of modernity, or will? At what point do we need a new term? To start that, that's a really good question. Oh, Astro-modernity has not been invented, but there should be something to describe it. Yeah, you're right. At what point? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. And so again, like everything else, I don't know. It's the answer. The question is better than any answer. It's very good. Our organizers, do you want to have the final word? Well, yes. First of all, I would want to thank you again. I hope you guys enjoyed this event. A lot of good has been great during this uh, this talk. Uh, the different ramification of space, uh, the economic uh, prospects, the mining, the legal aspects, the ethical aspects, the question we should ask ourselves, the colonization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Space has a tremendous impact on our world, whether it is through actual events or even on the more social cultural way, the way it shapes our vision of the world, of our place in the universe. Uh, the effect of uh, science fiction, for example, on, on human development. And all of these are going to be different themes that we're going to treat throughout our events this year. I hope you guys enjoyed this event. If you want to see more, and if you're passionate about this, about uh, about law, about international relations, about uh, culture, about business, entrepreneurship, I really recommend you that you follow us on IE Connect as the Space and Politics Club, and also on Instagram. Uh, ie.space underscore politics where we post all of the information about our events uh, we're going to move on to a small networking event so i really encourage you guys to talk to one another uh, share this passion that is uh, uniting us today and uh, i hope that you enjoy this event and i hope to see you guys again thank, thank you, you for coming Thank <laughs> you.